Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. Don't forget, if you want to stay up to date with everything we're up to, you can subscribe to our newsletter on our homepage at www.kisorganics.com. Our guest this week is Chris Trump. Chris is a master natural farmer certified by Master Cho of Korea. He has also studied microbiological analysis under Dr. Elaine Ingham. His family's farm is currently the largest natural farm in America, growing over 800 acres of macadamia nuts. They have returned sick trees to vital health, completely eliminating three fungal diseases that academics said was impossible. Now, Chris and I talk about the successes he's had with Korean natural farming and the philosophy behind it, which you'll hear both of us refer to periodically as KNF. We don't go too deeply into how many of the nutrients are made, as I don't think audio is the best format for explaining in detail how to make the IMO preps. But if you go to the podcast page on the KISS Organics website, you can find links to more information and videos from Chris detailing exactly how this is done. I really enjoyed our conversation. It was great to hear about the amazing projects Chris is working on right now. I hope you enjoy it too. Welcome to the show, Chris. I really appreciate you coming on today. I'm excited to hear and learn all about Korean natural farming and sort of your role in that, uh, in that realm. So maybe you could start off telling me a little bit about your personal history and how you got into uh, KNF. Yeah, man, glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. And I, uh, I grew up farming. Um, the place I was born in Hualoa on the Big Island um, of Hawaii was a farm. We had goats and uh, cattle and milking cows and, um, yeah, good stuff. And growing up, we tried uh, my dad um farmed a bunch of different things and some super successfully and some not so successfully, which is the uh life of a farmer. Um and I loved it. I, I appreciated that perspective and kind of life growing up. I got to grow up a little bit in California, um, Monterey, California, as well as Hawaii. So, you know, I grew up uh roping cattle and castrating with the Paniolo in Hawaii, and then I go to uh, kind of city life in California, you know, having eaten cow testicles over the summer, and people are like, just no perspective of anything rural and country living, so it was it was a fun back and forth. They learned quickly that not to talk about uh, castrating cattle in a city school, because people don't really get that. But uh, we uh, we had fun, um, and so my dad brought over some of the first hair sheep to the Big Island, um, which is a, a type of sheep about a ton of wool. Um, so it's real short hair, great for tropical environments because the the wool sheep get all kinds of skin diseases in the the warm kind of humid conditions of Hawaii. So. They brought them over with the idea that they'd be a little bit closer to Micronesia and uh, some of the other Pacific Islands um, because there's pretty poor um, protein sources there. They have cattle, but often not refrigeration. So for a family to butcher a cow, um, you know, they don't, they can't really deal with it in enough time for it not all to spoil. The sheep was going to be a better option. So we're still working on that. This December, I think, we'll ship some... uh, Sheep for breeding to Cambodia um, as part of that kind of long-term vision and uh, help with um, a small farm there that's trying to create a breeding program. So, yeah, we still have about 100 sheep. We had 1,000. Um, about 30 years ago, my dad started uh, farming macadamia nuts. The situation happened. There was an existing orchard, and we got to uh, move in and start farming it. We don't own the land. We lease the land. Um, but we used to run about a thousand sheep in the orchard and then some of the laws changed and yeah, so we run about 200 sheep now, but I uh, still have the farm. So currently my family farms, 
800 acres of organic macadamia nuts, um, all using Korean natural farming um, and just composting as the exclusive um, kind of nutrition program for the trees. And it's working really, really well. We're in a better position as a farm kind of than we've ever been. And uh, it's exciting. It's been a journey. Well, I can relate a little bit because my father had a nursery and landscaping business growing up. So I grew up around plants myself and having uh, parents that were really into farming and organics and growing plants in general. So I, I understand that connection between family business and farms and that sort of thing. And uh, I feel very fortunate to have had that growing up myself. Um, and I got to see a little bit of what you were talking about when I visited the Big Island in terms of the the horses and the the cowboys, the the paniolo. I think it is what what they're called. Is I think that's what you said. So, uh, really interesting history there too. Now, everyone says that you're the guy to talk to uh, when it comes to Korean natural farming uh, here in America. I know there's other people too, but they are unwilling to necessarily bridge the gap between cannabis and uh, and agriculture, which I can totally understand and respect. But um, people do talk about how much success you've had. And you're, you yourself are not a cannabis farmer. Is that correct? No, I'm not. So you've, you've been growing uh, the macadamia nut trees. And how did, you, how did you find out about Korean natural farming to even bring it onto your property? Yeah, that was a bit of a journey. And, uh, you know, I can... I, I'm definitely not a not a cannabis farmer, but there has been times in my life where I have uh, <laughs> been a cannabis farmer. Uh, I wouldn't quite call that a farmer. I don't think anything a high schooler does is uh, considered farming for the most part. But uh, um, yeah, for for us in the trees, um, that was a journey. Um, I grew up with a lot of really smart people in my industry in um, the in orchard crops. Um, in Hawaii, um, where kind of the cultivation of macadamia nuts as a commercial operation was begun. Um, there, was, there was a lot of really informed and knowledgeable people. So I got to be around them growing up, which was a real gift, and um, hear recommendations for trees and the way things work. Um, yeah, macadamia nuts came from Australia originally, but they were just kind of a wild, uh, never really cultivated um, tree there. And uh, Hawaii um, began kind of variety trials and uh, started that, and then the Australians took it back from Hawaii and, and began on their own. So um, for us, it was a bit of a journey to recognize um, about 12 years ago maybe 13, that the people that were experts in our industry in macadamia nuts might not be able to explain everything that's going on in nature and how best to attend to the trees. We had an event where we had major crop failure. Uh, long story, but the short of it is we had to let um, our organic, we were a split operation at that time, we had to let about 360 acres go fallow. And um, during that time, they became far healthier than they'd been with extensive amendments and uh, stuff. We were doing kind of traditional organic um, practices with some purchase amendments and composting. And uh, in, in three years of left, being left alone, they were healthier than they had been in a really long time. And uh, that we made kind of a commitment. Um, I guess it was my job, but... Um, made a commitment to kind of not know anything. So we began to just kind of, what, what did nature do? What is nature doing? And how can we kind of do that in, uh, in the future? How can we partner with what just happened? We watched trees go from yellow to green and from low in production to higher in production while being completely ignored for three years. And um, that um, led us to explore different things that were going on in the aquaponic explosion and uh, and then into Korean natural farming. Um, there were people bringing, so 
kind of the initiator of this was this guy, Dr. Park, Dr. Hoon Park. Um, he's a pediatrician turned like after 50 years of watching kind of disease increase at the same time as um, medicine got better. He said, there's something wrong. It must be our food. And uh, he went to Korea, sat in a 10 hour, two day class, you know, two, two days of 10 hours a day, standing room only in a little shed to listen to this guy, Cho Han Yu. And um, who people call Master Cho, um, which is just a term for teacher in uh, Korea. He came back and he's like, he started just being a sharer of that information. I went to one of the first classes he was teaching about, and uh, people were heckling, heckling them because it's a, or it's a bit of a mind shift from how we traditionally do things. So one of the things that really got some hackles or whatever laughter from the crowd was um, he talked about transplanting a tree and I don't know if you for your listeners transplanting a tree traditionally it's just really gentle and you you know really try and alleviate any shock by you know not not disturbing it too much and uh, prepping your hole and there's there's all kinds of good ways to do it but um, Korean natural farming you take it you wash off all the potting soil or all the dirt, um, you trim the taproot and you let it dry for a day or two, depending on the size of the tree. And uh, everybody just flipped out. And uh, I'm scratching my head because that is not how you transplant a tree. Um, But then he's like, and then you take this nutrient, you soak it, and uh, then you plant it, and this whole idea of helping it to move out in its cedar roots, seeking water, you've given it this idea that it needs to work on roots because there could be a drought. And uh, so I was like, well, I committed not to knowing anything and uh, just was like, what is this? And uh, but that really works. I've done that many times. Um, that was 10 years ago a little more than 10 years ago, and uh, it works. It's it's an incredible way to transplant trees, and the trees do work on root production um, before leaf production in that scenario, and they get, you know, stronger. If they, if they survive, um, they're going to continue to survive, and it's just fun. Um, but then uh, Master Cho and his daughter came to my tiny small town in Kohala, so it was just kind of a right place at a time when we were already seeking these answers because of what nature had done on our farm. And, um, and then it began a journey of going to a bunch of times to study. And um, when we started, we were just kind of skeptical, uh, as farmers tend to be. So we, we just decided to do it really well, um, but had no real um, preconceived expectations. We were just going to watch what it did. And uh, we had results. We had really great results. We had a, uh, there's a disease in macadamia in that industry called macadamia quick decline, macadamia slow decline. And uh, it's a root-borne fungal disease called Phytophthora. And um, we had some effective trees in the, effective trees in the sporting tree trial we did. And we started uh, applying IMO we had made. Um, some biochar and some sprays, and we had done it right according to, you know, we had really been diligent with uh, the process of natural farming. We didn't know if it was going to fail or not, but we didn't want it to fail because we screwed it up. We wanted to kind of give it a good try. And uh, we had these trees recover, these disease trees that in our industry, you push them after a year or two, and they bounce back. Um, within a year, they were refoliated, these trees get fully defoliated and then um, just kind of keel over and they refoliated within a year. And by year two, they were back in production. And by year three, they were like healthy, vibrant trees. And um, yeah, there's, there's a whole lot more to that journey of scaling up, you know, going from these concepts that were being taught to us and, and wheelbarrow kind of scale to 800 acre scale. That was, a serious journey 
that that was pretty much for me, it was pretty much by myself. Um, I did have a buddy that'd come out and just be a real encouragement and help me out. This guy, Poncho San Pedro, he's a crazy horse guitarist. Um, and he was, um, he was, he just made it fun, you know, to have somebody to work because most of the people on our farm were just like, what are we doing? You're crazy. I was called a math scientist, but, um, now we we're full tilt. Um, we have a big old operating lab or kind of warehouse facility all geared around, um, just kind of, um, efficiencies in the natural farming process uh, for our large farm. Wow. So basically you had this, you were on this journey of trying to find the right, the right method for your farm and try something new. And so you just started from scratch and decided you were going to give this a shot and you kept having more and more success following these, these tech natural farming techniques. Is that about, I mean, the gist of it? Yeah. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't start natural farming because we're like, oh, this philosophy is what we have to do. Um, we, I, I had 30 employees and their priority on our farm. They're kind of the, the main reason in a kind of economically suppressed town. Um, and so we weren't going to do something that jeopardized kind of taking care of what we had to do. We had to be farmers first. So we weren't going to go out of business for some Korean natural farming philosophy. Um, we do Korean natural farming and we continued from kind of the step-by-step trials and scaling up because it worked and we just saw success at each kind of um, scale uh, step. So that brings up a question for me. How do you feel Korean natural farming compares to other, you know, organic or natural farming techniques that you see out there like uh, Fukuoka with uh, One Star Revolution? or biodynamics, mm-hmm. you have your soil food web people, regenerative agriculture, mm-hmm. probiotic farming. You know, there's all these different groups that are all slightly different, but on a similar path. Um, what separates in your eyes, you know, KNF from, from some of these other methods? Yeah, it's, so in a lot of ways, there's, it's all kind of the same thing, right? These work or don't work because they work or don't work with how nature's designed or, or function. It's, it's like gravity. You know, most sports that you have all have these similar um, kind of features go anywhere in the world because they all play on gravity affecting the ball falling back down or, you know, it's, it's so a lot of these things play into um, they they use the principles of nature, and that's why they work. So there's not one method to tend to the life of your soil. There's been methods all over the world throughout the centuries um, that you know that were scientific methods. You know, science is is the observation and study of nature, and and uh, they were scientific in that they stopped doing what didn't work and kept doing what worked. Farmers aren't stupid. You know, so after, you know, several generations, the things that worked were the ones that were passed down. Those were the successful things for the farmer. So you have like um, Iceland, they'd take, uh, you know, manure from the end of the season, stuff it in a hollowed out horn and bury it, you know, below where the freeze goes. And then next year they'd dig it up and they'd spread it on their field right when um, after the thaw and they'd have a jump start to the microbial life in their soil and the production of crops. Well, they didn't know what microbes were, but they knew that worked. Somehow somebody figured out that worked. And, um, you know, that was a way to basically protect the vibrant soil life from a freeze and uh, get it, you know, back up to speed a little faster so that they could get a little longer season for their crops. Um, So, yeah. um, So short answer um, the difference is methodologies, et cetera. Um, what I like about Korean natural farming is that for, for me, it's an elegant method. So as I encountered all these um, inputs and ways to do this, I, I, I kind of dug in and asked why. Um, 
that's kind of how my mind works. I need to kind of understand because I need to know, especially as I scaled, what things can I mess with or what things are shiftable and what aren't. Um, and I know that I can't just change things because I don't want to do it. Because if I don't understand it, I don't know what I'm changing and what I'm losing. And so um, as I dug into the why, I found a lot of solid science, a lot of the things that we were teasing at understanding in the you know, um, microbiological world were principles that this was based on. And, and um, so when you studied in Japan with um, enzyme um, doctors and um, some of these natural farming um, kind of leaders there. And it's, it's based on good science. So it's a way that is scalable, that is um, extremely effective and works for commercial ag. And that's, um, that's not true in, in all um, kind of natural farming principles and practices. Um, though they are all paired with how nature works, um, some of them are extremely difficult to scale um, or just the efficiencies of, of farming um, kind of make them untenable. Like um, permaculture, for example, permaculture is rad and based on the principles of nature. Um, but if you give me an 800 acre farm and my spinach is sparse here and there over 800 acres, when I have a spinach, a spinach harvest, um, my cost to harvest spinach um, is pretty high just because of efficiencies, you know, the inability to get it all in a basket and get it to market. Um, but if I have a s small family or a few families and I have a giant permaculture food forest in my backyard, then it's great. We can just go out and pick whatever we want when we want to eat. Um, you know, permaculture doesn't work um, for us, and it, it wouldn't have worked for us on our farm because of the drastic inefficiencies that would have basically been um, real dollars and cents issues. Um, see, see, I would argue. Well, well, first off, I want to say that I love your your philosophy there. I I'm in a similar boat in the sense that I believe that all of these groups, including permaculture, are all on the same path. And there's many ways to grow a plant and, uh, you know, KNF being one of them. And I, I love the idea that we can, you know, all go in the same direction and maybe pull and use information from all of these without throwing science out the window. And I, I, to me, that's an important aspect of all of them. And I think that, you know, taking a scientific approach to something like nature is, is very doable and they're not um, mutually exclusive approaches or ideas. And in terms of permaculture, just from my own experience, I would, I would almost want to say that that's, a, that's an inefficient permaculture design because really the way I see permaculture, it's, just, it's, it's all about design. It's all about patterns and utilizing the resources that you have in whatever location or uh, project that you're working on. So if, if spinach harvest is part of your revenue, then you need to utilize a design that will make it efficient for you to harvest that spinach so that your overall processes can be, uh, you know, can be maximized. So, um, you know, not, not every permaculture is, is a food forest because food forests may not make sense depending on what your overall goal for that property is, if that makes sense. All right. So I, I love permaculture and I, I like, all the principles in it because I feel like it's an observation of nature and using how nature works. Um, but why does the tree in permaculture help the overall production? The, the fruit trees? The, the, the tree aspect of it, the tall canopy plant. Oh boy. I, you know, I'm not, um, I guess strong enough in permaculture to really be able to answer. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, so, so I, it was it was rhetorical. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So the the trees take this incredible strength they have as they grow, and uh, they create relationships. Soil food web, right? They create relationships with their root tips, and they they tend to that fungal network in a way that um, some of the lower plants 
don't do as well. They're just really good at creating partnerships with um, fungus at their at their root tips, and they're such a, a big organism that all of that photosynthesis and energy and and exchange really tends to the whole area. Um, as a result, the whole area is benefited. And so the the idea of getting the taller tree and it, it benefiting or helping with the diversity um in in the soil is um is a great concept and it's true it's a true observation of nature and, and the partnering with how nature works. Um but and as a farmer, if I can get that diversity of microbial life and tend to that microbial life um by bringing in the diversity of the forest and um, and helping it get established in my farmland and then just tending to it being established, just helping it stay kind of um, vibrant in my soil, then I can get the benefit of the diversity of microbial lives um, without needing a forest in my farm to do so. And that's um, where I think permaculture has got it. And if, as a row crop farmer, I can get that effect by bringing in a indigenous microbial, highly diverse mix, then I might go that route rather than planting trees. So you're trying to imitate some of the benefits that you would get from something, some of these permaculture designs or a food forest, but in more of a traditional uh, agricultural design that's more efficient for harvesting is essentially what I'm... Efficient, yeah, efficiency. So, so science is the study of nature. You, you, you don't partner with nature and do it scientifically. Science is just learning from and and studying nature. We, we've deviated in thinking science and nature are one because we've gotten off into the you know production of chemicals, but you know or or whatnot. But all those polymers and chemicals, they're all based on principles we learn from nature, what nature's already doing. And, um, you know, it's, it's fun. So yeah, all those, all those things you mentioned, soil, food, web, biodynamics, they've all observed something about nature and are just trying to emulate it. So on that note, I guess I should have been more specific in terms of saying scientific method instead of just science in the sense that we're controlling for a variable and observing the results. And I think that's something that can be applied to anything. And that's something that I really do believe in uh, when it comes to really understanding how something works. Because my brain's the same way. Like I want to know more about the how and why uh, rather than just the process itself. But um, I guess my, my, my problem I have, and this is not with KNF, and this is not necessarily with any of these sort of um, different methods, but some of the, the fanaticism that I see when people are, you know, say that maybe KNF is the way that you need to grow, it's the only way, or biodynamics, or soil food web, or, sure. you know, wh- whatever type of methodology to the exclusion of the other methods. Uh, to me, that's I really struggle with. Like, it can f- almost feel cultish in some cases, and I haven't necessarily seen that with KNF, but um, I have seen it with some of these other methodologies. Uh, what's What's your experience or thoughts on all that? Yeah, I I see that, and and it's in natural farming or creating natural farming as well. There's there's people, especially in the beginning, and I just as a farmer, just saying, you know, I I had to just say, you know what, I got to figure out if this works. And if it works and makes, you know, where we can be productive farmers, then there's a reason for it. Um, I can't just pick it up as my religion or something. It's not, that doesn't work for us to be farmers, you know, um, because I'm, and it, and it doesn't work for, for the world to change and, and have increase in quality of food either. You know, the pitch to take, to go to a conventional, you know, wheat farmer, or corn farmer and say, hey, I got this idea. I think it's really good for the world. You should go out of business little by little over the next 10 years to to jive with my philosophy. That's a hard sell. They're like, no, thank you. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. But if I say, hey, um, I make more money than you uh, and my crops better um, and I have more time with my family, I think you should check out what I'm doing. That's a, That's a much easier sell. And, um, and it's, it's true, you know, uh, for us on, in the farm, 
in Hawaii. Um, you know, and our, our industry hasn't gotten into it yet. They don't really understand what we're doing. They like the look of our trees and our crops, but they don't really know what we're up to. I'm going to speak in China, actually, in October, if I can submit my PowerPoint before they yell at me. But um, there is the International Marketing Symposium is held in China this year, and they asked me to speak about what we've accomplished on our trees because some of the leaders in the international community came out and saw our trees and were like, what is going on here? Um, but, no, it can't, it can't be just a philosophy or farmers can't get behind it. And if this is a movement of farmers, then I think farmers have to be able to get into it. And so um, it has to equate for a farmer to increase production or time or quality of product. It, it has to, or it's like, why? And, um, and then as far as each individual group, you know, it's, it's what people know, you know, the, they can't get behind something they don't know. And if it's, if it's their livelihood that they're, they're making money from, you know, the selling of their idea, then, you know, they also don't want to nod at any other idea because that might threaten or whatever. So, um, when somebody, you know, knows something and they don't know something else, then it's just normal to, you know, say, Oh, uh, this is good. And I don't know about all that or, or to even be kind of antagonistic towards something else because they just don't understand it. And, and that's kind of human condition. So we're all kind of on a similar path in terms of, of these natural farming and these different methods. And as I would venture to say, as you come to understand well, them. Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys. Oh, no, it's okay. I was just going to say, as you come to understand the how and why behind some of these practices, which I want to talk to you about next. Um, maybe you can pick and choose the ones that are best fitting for your environment. So I have, I have some good cannabis friends that are uh, growers and excellent growers, and they use certain aspects of KNF in their gardens and it works really well for them. They're not doing everything the way a Korean natural farmer might do it, but they've definitely pulled aspects because they've taken the time to learn and understand what those particular uh, inputs and things will, the effects that they'll have on their plants. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, and the thing is like, there's some aspects to each one of these that probably aren't super good or that given a change could be better. And that's the part, that's the part that, you know, if, if somebody defends it just because it's something they do or something they, they know, um, that's where it's like, nothing. I don't, I don't want to stay on a, a ship that I know has a hole in it just because it's got my name on the side or, you know, so something like that. So I, um, I think if we can be honest as we learn, um, I think that's the key. So, you know, the, the whole world's learning right now that there's a whole lot more to the interconnectivity of nature than we knew as a scientific community and, uh, and that there's a long journey ahead of us. And uh, as each group or, you know, camp learns, oh, this actually isn't very good. Um, if we're honest about that and we can adapt and move forward, then I think it'll be just a, it'll be a lot of fun to see what kind of world our kids get to do and play with in agriculture. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we're all promoting organic farming and healthier ways to grow food locally and that's better for the environment. So at the end of the day, we're all on the same side. I totally agree with you on that. Um, so just turning, switching directions here, can we talk a little bit and, and maybe I'll, uh, maybe we'll get into this on another podcast or something down the road, but can you give us just a, a general idea of some of the inputs with KNF and, and sort of the philosophies specific to KNF? Yeah. Um, some of the philosophies, um, are like um, a similarity of plants to um, humans, you know, in life cycle, in kind of um, 
ebbs and flows of nutritional needs. And uh, so one of the ways that that philosophy plays into practical um, kind of work for a farmer is they, the idea that we need um, a little bit of nutrients or the right, excuse me, the right amount of nutrients at the right time. And um, so philosophy-wise, we're, we're not a front-loading with all the plants' nutritional needs um, from day one. We're, we're tending to the kind of changing needs of our plants based on its um, growth cycle. So, you know, and a lot of cannabis farmers understand that concept. Um, and in creating natural farming, it applies to um, corn, to trees, to lettuce, all across the board. And, you know, the whole infancy and the low nutritional needs and then... Um, vegetative growth, a, a changeover period where there's uh, kind of a morning sickness like a human has, and then reproductive growth, and, and all the all the ways you observe um, your plants and uh, feed it accordingly. That's, that's pretty central in the feeding of in Korean natural farming. Um, the concept of using indigenous microbes, um, the balance um, and diversity that works or has worked for um, kind of untended for thousands of years in undisturbed forest or um, kind of land in the surrounding area is what will self-perpetuate on your farm. Um, so that that idea of um, getting the thriving um, kind of soil food web or microbial life from your area um, and applying it in your area is uh, a central idea. And um, so, yeah, there's, there's kind of the microbial input, which is indigenous microorganism, and uh, that that process is pretty entailed. And then there's the kind of nutritional and seed um, aspect of Korean natural farming, which is a variety of inputs that are able to be soil drenched in or uh, taken into uh, foldier feeding. So I don't want to get into all the inputs because I know it's a rather complex uh, subject and there's a lot that goes into it. And if someone really wants to learn, they're going to have to do more research than they can pick up in, you know, listening to a, to a podcast for an hour. But I want to give them a taste of sort of the philosophies of it, which I think you did. So essentially what we're talking about here is, is locally sourced nutrient inputs and essentially locally sourced microorganisms as sort of the two main drivers for KNF. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. And it's also inexpensive. The, the idea that you can use, um, you can use things that you might otherwise think of as waste or um, kind of low value um, become pretty valuable or usable um, in the natural farming farm. And so like on our farm, we, we, everything, all of our byproducts now are really cared for um, because we can do so much with them. They become so um, usable. And um, yeah, so our, our farm has become kind of a real recycler of local inputs and, and user. And, and that's, I mean, when we're on an island in the middle of if it's not shipping things in, um, can can really equate to dollars and cents as well. Oh yeah, I mean that makes a ton of sense because we're reducing our environmental impact with uh, fossil fuels and getting material out to you. Uh, you're you're going to save a ton of money, and uh, I, I totally get that. So can you give me an example that say someone on the mainland might use of a a waste product nutrient source that KNF is recycling back into? A, a beneficial input on their soil? Sure. Um, so um, all of the, yeah, let's see. So fermented plant juice is a um, input in Korean natural farming. It's a plant food. Uh, it's a ferment. And uh, some of the misconceptions I've seen online is that we have to get it like store-bought, you know, nice fruit to make, uh, fermented plant juice, and that's actually not really Korean natural farming um, philosophy. It's just something that got a little 
um, changed online. But um, you can go out and get a lead, uh, quite literally a uh, local um, invasive or a local just grows everywhere, but never touch it. It's always healthy and green. Um, and that can become a real food source, not a theoretical food source, but just like people buy kelp. You know, they get kelp and, and they use kelp and they're like, wow, I get great results with kelp. Um, the beneficial biochemicals in any thriving plant, um, for whatever reason, the plant that's thriving, the weed that's thriving in your zone, is able to take up nutrients extremely well. For it to thrive there when nobody farms it, it's just a thing that grows everywhere and it's always healthy. Um, it's, it's taking up nutrients well and it's going to be um, filled with the kind of the plant growth hormone and uh, other beneficial biochemicals um, that plant actually benefits from. It's not it's not pretend. It's it's kind of in the world of cutting edge research that a lot of your your plant companies are looking at now. They know that plants have these biochemicals that can help other plants grow. They don't know exactly how it works yet, and they're trying to isolate them and figure out how each one works individually. But you can just take this concept of using the new growing tips or kind of the thriving um, fresh plant and fermenting it and getting out that um, nutrient and then applying it to your plant. So all of a sudden your ice plant or your ivy or your rhubarb or a um, hundred other kind of weed type things in your area become um, a resource that actually has equates to production on your farm. And that's, that's pretty cool. So you're taking like a healthy biomass from whatever plants are thriving in your local region and then fermenting it and making it into a, a liquid nutrient, essentially? Yeah, exactly. Now, my initial thought on that is uh, many weeds, just tissue testing and things, are quite low in macronutrients. Um, right, definitely. But you're getting a lot of trace elements, like you mentioned, kelp and Kelp's wonderful for the reasons that you do get, you know, 70 different trace elements. You get uh, plant growth hormones and regulators. It has a ton of benefits. It's been widely studied, but uh, mm -hmm. not terribly high in NPK. There's a little bit in there, but um, are, are you thinking that the main benefit from these things then would be, um, would be trace elements or, or, you know, mineral nutrients that are a little bit, uh, a little bit smaller and maybe lacking in the soil or lacking in the plant's ability to take them up? So I have all kinds of um, theories and I can tie it to uh, a lot of current research in this kind of realm of how these, you know, they're taking these plants from the desert that grow like crazy. They're extracting these specific biochemicals. Um, combining it with other similar properties and other plants and then applying it to plants and getting these incredible results. And exactly what's going on there and why plants respond like that to these things, um, I don't understand personally. Um, and I think a lot of the people researching them understand aspects, but how they work together, um, how that, you know, might help a plant with its root zone or its... Um, interconnectivity with the soil food web or um, any number of things, its uptake of nutrients, its ability for the microbes in its root zone to uptake nutrients or transfer nutrients. Um, these are a lot of questions that we're all, as a community of um, researchers, asking right now and trying to learn. Um, so what I like in playing in nature is that um, I've held on to that. Um, and this is actually a core natural farming uh, principle, but we started it before we knew natural farming. So I've held on to that thing that happened on our farm where I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to know nothing. I've had a lifetime growing up with experts in my field. I'm going to check that knowledge at the door. Not that I throw it away because farming knowledge is awesome and it, and it all interacts with and, and applies in using 
degree in natural farming, but I'm going to say it's okay to not know um, and learn something. And so um, empty mind is a uh, core kind of philosophy in natural farming. That's very kind of Asian thought, but um, it's helpful because it's like, hey, imagine for a moment that you don't know everything about what you're talking about or what you farm. Imagine for a moment that that's true. Um, what might you learn or what might you be up for trying to see how it works or succeed? And uh, so exactly why um, uh, uh, new growing tips of a vibrant plant in your area um, equate to a real response in a plant um, when combined with um, vinegar and oriental herbal nutrient, which is something we make um, you know, and vinegar micronizes or helps um, water particles and the uptake. And, you know, why all of this, you know, why plants respond to like this, um, I'm not sure. I have, Again, I have ideas and things I've read that's like, oh, wow, that's part of it, and we're learning about that. But a lot of this is research that we get, we're going to get watch, get to watch um, come to fruition over the next 10, 20 years. Um, where we actually understand how this all works. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that. Like, there's so much we don't know about the soil and about how plants utilize nutrients in the soil that we're still learning. Um, so it, it's entirely possible, and I think it's okay not to know why. At, at the same time, I don't, I don't think we need to be afraid to say we don't know or to, say, or to yeah. still want to do something as long as we're being open-minded, like you said, to learning more. And if if we learn down the down the way that maybe it wasn't the and and this may not be the best example, but maybe maybe you were getting the results because of the vinegar or because of the particular water or one of the other inputs, then, sure. then you can adapt and improve. Or the sugar. Sure. Yeah. Which I, I doubt and this is the best example of that, but I, I think that sort of uh philosophy of always wanting to learn and, and applying scientific method to what you're trying so you can really find out what's making a difference in that plant's health is really important. Totally. That's, I think, yeah, I think what you just said, the scientific method, like everybody's like, oh, well, I think this is a good idea if I just throw all this stuff in a bucket and put it on. And like, my plants are super healthy this year. And it's like, well, would they have been healthy this year if you didn't do that? Like, I love the idea of side-by-side trials and, and the control. And uh, yeah, we we played with a lot of that over the years on the farm because I didn't understand what I could change and, and what was helpful. And I, um, Elaine Ingham actually, and, uh, um, coming to, again, my tiny town in, in Hawaii and teaching us to use the microscope and, and make qualitative assessment, um, was, was a huge key for me, um, to kind of in this journey in natural farming to be able to change things based on, um, what kind of microbial growth and life and diversity I was seeing under the microscope. That was, that was a big deal. That was actually came in again, kind of just the right time when I was asking those questions. Oh, I want to talk about that. So uh, <laughs> there's two things that I really want to talk about with you. Uh, the first one would be indigenous microorganisms, since this is such a key aspect of KNF, the idea of sourcing and using local microorganisms. So uh, I gave you the example when we were talking earlier offline about uh, how Steve Solomon talks. He's a he's a mineral nutrient guy, so he's he's not as big on soil biology, but he's really big about remineralization of of soils. So assuming Steve, who? Steve Solomon, um, oh yeah, he okay. uh, he wrote a book called The Intelligent Gardener, which is a really good book on on mineralization and understanding soil testing for people that are looking to get into that, but. Uh, one thing he talks about that I, I that really resonated with me was the idea that, you know, he was farming on land that was exceedingly low in calcium, and so his crops were suffering, and they were low in calcium as well. And he didn't know this at the time, but he, you know, he's compo- he's composting those crops, and he's eating those crops primarily, and his health is starting to go downhill. And what he was finding was when he took that compost that he was making and then applied it back to the land, he was really just compounding his problem because if his, if 
what was uh, limiting the, the biggest limiting factor to growth in his soil was calcium. And he was putting, applying compost that was low in calcium. He was just compounding a problem. So I would apply this to indigenous microorganisms. So if your soil, if you're using indigenous microorganisms in a soil that is, say, deficient or depleted or has the wrong ratio of microorganisms, wouldn't bringing in an outside source add diversity that would either die off and become food sources for your indigenous microbes or possibly survive and fill a niche that was previously unoccupied by the best beneficial microorganism? Yeah, I think, I think the, the question that you're asking is kind of two parts. You're, you're talking about minerals with Solomon's example, which is a great, a great um, question and uh, really interesting one. Um, and how nature works in balance um, on, on a mineral level. Uh, we see it in seawater, the incredible diversity of um, mineral seawater and how it stays in, in some sort of balance. And uh, actually, I actually have an example of a, a guy in uh, Waimea, uh, Kailu, um, Kamwela in, uh, on the Big Island, and he's a... Wow Farms, he's a tomato farmer, a great tomato farmer, um, and he teaches a lot of um, uh, Hawaiian people to, to farm like he does on their land, and just a cool, cool family, and just killing it in production of tomatoes. Um, and uh, he, he doesn't do green natural farming. He does um, organic farming and front loads and minerals. Um, he lets the crop, he lets the tomatoes grow one full crop and then he replaces them with fresh starts and he's just he has it dialed um but he had a um i think it was sulfur it was it was atmospheric mineral um that just was destroying um his crop and um he he doesn't have this extreme um like um college background in agriculture. Um, we, he studied other things. And so he just intuitively said, I need to balance the minerals. And so he loaded up all this other huge kind of overloaded the plants way more than he would normally do to balance this. I think it was sulfur that came in um, through the rain because of our volcanic ash. And um, he he loaded up on the other minerals that balanced or, or worked in conjunction with, and um, he had just the most beautiful crop. And it went, all these plants recovered and went gangbusters. And these, these guys from the university system were like, well, why did you do that? Why did you add in all these other minerals? Like, those, those are way too much minerals or this and that. And he's like, well, it just seemed right to balance it. That's why they were suffering from the imbalance of this this um imbalance that came in and, uh, you know he doesn't he's not apologizing for not understanding exactly why is he's just saying it works and uh there would need to be a lot more study to say that's empirical evidence of this or that but um it just um i see that in nature we nature wants um balance for for a lot of the crops that we would grow or or a little you know, some crops like a little imbalance one way or another, or pH. Um, but, um, yeah, so I could totally see uh, Steve, Steve Solomon kind of playing with those things and seeing the results um, and taking an imbalanced crop and keep applying it. You perpetuate the imbalance. Um, and uh, with soil microbes, though, I think um, it is actually an entirely different question that's being asked though um, I recognize that those kind of connect for you. Um, I don't believe they are quite the same. Um, and it is totally possible that you could buy some lab-grown microbe um, and add it to what's going on and then it finds some niche and stays established. And that's totally possible. Um, generally, what we see with uh, microbe-grown, you know, like Okinawa's microbial life brought in, um, to grow a crop is that it has 
incredible results, first of all. So there's nothing wrong with buying bugs in a jug and a soil microbial life um, from some place that makes it, but it tends to have about a six-month fall-off. Now, an indoor grow, um, I think there's a lot to study in that and how, how that all might work. But, um, you know, the the generally speaking outdoors, you're going to have this kind of complete dissipation over six months. Um, though it totally helps plants grow food and all you need to do is reapply it to kind of get it uh, up again and feed it and etc. But um, the idea of using indigenous microbial life, so say I go in and I got cropland and it was um, tilled or farmed with uh, really noxious chemicals from a different farming method and I come in to farm it and I want to tend to life the soil. Well, you know, bacteria can come in on the wind and yeast can. Fungi doesn't as easily. Um, and uh, so I might have a very, very small range of microbial diversity on that land, even though the surrounding area might be rich or untouched. Um, I had a soil scientist out where we farmed in Hawaii, and he was studying the difference um, of 100 feet away from each other. Um, and downhill, 100 feet, or, or, you know, from the fence line, he had the fence line as the divider. On one side of the fence line, it had been farmed in sugarcane, which is a pretty intensive um, and not always very holistic um, um, farming practice done on the islands. And on the other side, it had never been in crop production. Um, there had been cattle on it, but it had never been kind of the land ripped up. And the amount of soil microbial diversity for the soil life was, um, he, I forget the exact numbers, but it was, it was major, like 10, 10 to 1 as far as different microbes. And we're talking literally 100 feet in the same area, in the same rainfall, barometric pressure, everything, um, just on the other side of the fence. And so as much as there's been rain and and uh, animals traveling, a lot of that um, microbial life didn't bounce back. It didn't just come from that uphill spot and move into, back into this area. Um, so the idea of transferring indigenous microbes is, is something where we're just helping to take a soil food web or the, the microbial thriving life of a fertile zone and bring it in. And we don't just pick one spot in natural farming. We're trying to get it from 10 different spots in the local area where it's kind of untouched microbial diversity. And we're hoping for exactly that. We're hoping that some of it might be the exact same thing that already exists on my land, but some of it might be something that actually needs a little assistance to move back in because it doesn't just blow in on the wind. And um, so we bring in some soil, um, from our farm and hopefully some from just outside or, and then uh, we bring in, uh, we try and cultivate and collect um, indigenous microbial inoculum from the local area. Again, hoping that it does kind of fill in. And, and that doesn't mean that there's not another way to get some increased microbial diversity or that some things that somebody grows in a lab wouldn't establish in some places but um, there's very slight differences in um, varieties of um, microbes and what those differences equate to and how they interconnect with other microbes. We don't really understand all that. Sure. There's so much we don't know about the soil food web and nutrient cycling in plants and the rhizosphere that we still have to learn. So I totally agree with that. And I guess in terms of indigenous microorganisms versus outside sources, my thought was not so much. Uh, man-made man or man-propagated uh, microbial sources, but rather uh, compost teas or extracts or things like that, because they've done research that shows that soil microbes are relatively ubiquitous in that 99 point whatever percent of them are found worldwide, but in different diversity and ratios and things like that. Um, and slightly, slightly different gene makeup. Yes. Yeah, so... The idea that, you know, you're sourcing from different areas around, say, an island like that, mm -hmm. 
I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess it's all how you define indigenous. If you're talking about just within your property, then I wonder if that, that is enough diversity or not. And I guess it's not really a question we can answer. Um, but No, yeah. In natural farming, you don't just go within your property. You got to go, you know, 500 feet up in elevation if possible and definitely to places as little disturbed for as many thousand years as possible. But I, I have heard that that argument before or that, that comment regarding these, you know, let's, let's just say bugs and jugger outside microbial sources when they're added in as not persisting in new in, in new areas. And I, I guess that's something that I've, I've never seen really good data on and I don't really understand it. Now, if you were to say that you apply a particular microbe species like a lactobacillus, for example, and it persists for the life of that crop, and then when that crop dies and something else comes in the soil, then it, it disappears and you have to reapply it. I could totally get behind that, but the idea that it would last for around six months and then suddenly have a die-off without any environmental change, I just don't understand why that would occur. Because it would have, I mean, if it's lasting for six months, that's successive generations of any bacterial colony, you know, at that point, or species being you know, relatively healthy and surviving and, and reproducing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think um, I think you've touched on something that is probably wrong in my language. Six months is far too much of a generalization for any, you know, real science talk. And, and so I I, uh, I just want to place uh, a delicate foot on the term six months because I think you're right. I think exactly which microbe and which bugs in the jug and how it persists in which environment, those are all going to be completely, you know, needing to be looked at individually. And, uh, you know, I can't, no, I can't I, make I've, it. I've heard this generalization, not just from you, but from other, uh, other people, mostly soil food web people. Um, and I'm really just asking the question. I'm not trying to pass judgment one way or another on it. This was just my initial thought regarding it. The idea that if something is going to persist, it either will persist or it won't persist. Um, it, and if it's not persisting, it's, it's only going to last, you know, a matter of a day or two would be my thought before it either ran out of food sources or got eaten by another microbe in the soil. Cause we're primarily adding bacteria. If, if that's what we're, what we're talking about. So I, I, yeah, and and so I I don't I don't have a total understanding of this, but as far as it's just to try and help wrap around some of the kind of possible environmental changes that can occur on a microbial level, um, the so say say something comes in and um, it's maybe your your land is needing some conditioning. It's it's a little hard or there's not a lot of thriving life, and you bring in something like a like a lactobacillus strain, uh, something in that, that family. Um, and uh, they break up the soil and you're feeding them in conjunction with that and watering and kind of putting in this crop. Um, then some of the things that were there but maybe weren't thriving um, get up to speed too because now your soil is more aerated, the earthworms have come, and stuff stuff's getting better or, or whatnot, um, the indigenous guys tend to beat out for territory um, things that maybe don't, it isn't their favorite zone, maybe not temperature, maybe whatever it is, rainfall, moisture, dryness. Um, and so my understanding is that there's a, um, uh, a losing out to the locals. Um, that that happens in uh, in kind of just competing for space in the in the soil column. So that's kind of how I've understood it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not something that we can necessarily settle today. <laughs> it's it. There's so much, like you said, there's so much we don't know. I just wanted to have a discussion about it because I think it's an interesting topic, and I, I've heard these things said, and I totally just was, was curious to hear another another idea on it um one other thing that I'm, I'm curious to get your opinion on is i hear uh especially from from soil food web people this idea of uh 
microbial ratios, your fungal to bacterial ratio, being what decides sure. your overall soil health and plant health. And by adjusting this, uh, that's how you really control that. Like that, that is the controlling variable for plant health and soil health. And that's something I haven't really been able to get my brain around as I've learned more over the years. I mean, that's sort of where I started in this industry with my father, but I've kind of, and I don't want to use the word evolved because I don't think that's fair, but I, I would say I've, I've changed my perspective a little bit into looking more at minerals and nutrients and their effects on soil health as well and how all of these things sort of work together. But I've heard a lot of uh, claims from you know, certain consultants or certain philosophies around the idea that if you know, your fungal to bacteria ratio is right, everything else is, gets corrected. Um, what are your experiences or your thoughts with that? Yeah, well, one of the things that, um, just to touch on that you kind of nodded to, um, is one of the, the, the biggest hole in all of this of our understanding is in the realm of interconnectivity and or interrelation. Um, so a lot of our study in the microbial world, in the world of uh, how that it, it in, microbes interact with plants and all this stuff, has been on this kind of older concept or concept that I don't think we're going to be able to keep moving forward, um, which is isolation. And, and it has a role. We need, to, we need to understand the microbe individually. But we isolate individual microbes. We try and figure out what their function is, how they work, how they contribute to this overall idea. And we don't actually understand how they work in community. We don't have like the the data processing, the ability to track interconnectivity. We're just not there technologically. We don't understand how these complex groups of microbial um, organisms interact um, on a level with with the nutrients in the soil and how they help each other or um, serve each other, that whole zone of understanding is pretty dark. Um, so we, we start like looking at one thing as science, scientists or different, you know, camps of understanding. We're like, well, I understand this. I've studied it a lot. And so this might be the whole answer, but really we have this soil column in any kind of soil-grown cropland, and it's full of all kinds of stuff, and, and bigger organisms and smaller organisms and plants photosynthesizing and pushing things down into the soil and the exchanges that happen there. And how it all works together is where we really need to grow in understanding. That's, that's where the big hole is because we don't understand how all the yeast and bacteria work together on the leaf of the plant to actually do something, you know, what is that, how does that interact with the dew and when it falls in the drip line, what does that do and, and uh, who's benefiting or how the yeast and the bacteria and the fungi work together to process and deal with minerals and make them plant available and, you know, um, those, those areas of interconnectivity um, is where the uh, Star Trek would be going if they were a soil microbial frontier uh, explore, um, and we're we're just beginning there to ask the right questions and to have tools to answer those. So, um, but in the uh, world of fungal bacterial uh, ratios and how that benefits plants, um, I think it's a huge deal. Um, I think each plant has its ideal zone um, as far as fungal to bacterial ratio. I've seen that evidenced. Um, you know, for a long, long time in, in my personal life growing up as a, a farmer's kid and getting to play with it. And um, and I've actually um, done a bunch of research on that front and uh, seen incredible results when messing with the fungal to bacteria ratios and what plants die and what plants thrive. Um, I almost killed five acres of trees once by messing with this in the wrong way before I understood it. I took a, so when I got into natural farming first, they brought over this machine 
and I was doing it, and I was making it for five acres, and it was a ton of work. And I brought over this machine from Korea to try and make IML on a large scale. And I was like, man, if I can just buy this stuff, that's just, that's great. And uh, so I bought 20 tons of IMO made machine, applied it on a five acre block of trees, and I nearly killed them all. I mean, they all turned the craziest yellow, like overnight. Within a week, they were all like, it looked like I had just starved them of water and all nutrients combined for over a year. And I was like, what happened? Um, everything else in the orchard's green and thriving. Only where I applied this inoculum did I see these trees like nearly croak. And um, and so then I, that was the time, that was the moment when I realized I can't leave understanding this stuff to anybody else. Like if the experts are giving me stuff that are going to kill my crops, I need to know what's going on. And it's not, no one was expert at that point. People didn't know what they're doing. But um, so I dug into it. I got a microscope and I looked like, what is in this? And it was all bacteria. And uh, it was made in 24 hours in a, in a boiler system kind of machine. And uh, my trees weren't having it. There was, there was nothing happy about this scenario for them. And um, what it was is I took a kind of stable soil environment that was far more fungally leaning than this inoculum I put down, and I just doused it with straight bacteria. And um, I'm, I'm a tree farmer. I know when the tree's not happy, and those trees were not happy. Um, and it was just, I just messed with the balance. I didn't put poison on. There wasn't there wasn't any real nutrient in that. It was simply an inoculum, and I almost killed them. On the flip side of that, um, University of Hawaii's research and development has uh, granted me money to research a project I did, where I uh, took this invasive that's killing all the cows, and because I, I theorized that it actually does, is a bacterial loving plant because. When we were conventional in our herbicide strips, herbicide, the type we were using, um, uh, it uh, glyphosate, it um, deoxygenates the soil. It, it reduces the ability for soil to oxygen transfer. And um, so it kills all the fungus and everything that loves the oxygen in the soil. And so if it kills everything, the first thing to come back is bacteria. And the first plant to thrive in these herbicide strips that we use to get the uh, trees off the ground or the nuts off the ground uh, with our ground harvesters was this fire wheat. It was always the first thing in the strips. And I was like, oh, they love crazy bacterial imbalance. And um, and it only messes with a real kind of surface um, soil. So it's not this complete devastation. of, But it's, it's pretty bad. Anyway, so we don't do that anymore. Our trees are happier for it. But what I did for uh, a cow farmer, a rancher, um, on his two-acre kind of hobby parcel that he had no more grass production. All he had was fireweed, and he got these quotes to do all this stuff to it that wasn't going to change anything. And I was like, okay, he was a friend of our family. So I went in, and I brought a, a highly fungal inoculum, and I just applied it. And then I seeded some grass where it had kind of in grassless, and I watched. And over the period of three months, all the fireweed died. It got powdery and mildew. It got predated on by um, aphids. So I, I would go out and look. We didn't pull any of those two acres. I'm not going to pull all the weeds in two acres. It was miserable. And uh, so I went out and looked at it, and it would be powdery mildew and just wilting and dying. Or if you looked at it right where it met the soil, it would be all covered in aphids. And what happened is this plant just became the weakest thing in the area. All the grass went gangbusters, um, went ballistic. He actually was able to run four cattle on two acres for two years in a row um, because he couldn't keep up with grass production. Um, I've since told him, like, that's not a good idea for sustainability. He does his own thing. It's his land. But right on the other side of the fence where we didn't apply IMO, the neighbor's pasture still was the exact same um, problem. It's still with solid fireweed. 
um, as far as you can see. And I had UH extension agents come out, University of Hawaii extension agents come out and look at this and watched it over four years. And um, Anyway, so we're running a trial right now to show that um, empirically so that they can use that to uh, help farmers on the island because they've spent millions of dollars trying to fix the fireweed problem. So fungal bacterial balance, yeah. I have a couple thoughts on that, and I want to hear your opinion. So first off, I, I loved what you said there at first about the uh, how much we don't know about soil biology. There's a lot we don't understand. Mm -hmm. I heard a, a wonderful soil, soil scientist once speak, and he talked about how we know more about what's going on at the bottom of the ocean and in outer space than we do literally under our feet. And it is symbiotic, and, and you can't take and isolate one microorganism without looking at all the others. So I totally agree with you on that. Now. When we start talking about fungal to bacterial ratio, to me, that feels too simplistic for the reasons you just stated. The idea that mm -hmm. we, since we don't know what's going on, the idea that we just take a plant succession chart, which is our soil succession chart as soil moves from highly bacterial towards more fungal and say an old growth forest versus a, you know, a new pasture. Yes, that's the case. But I wonder if that's not being pushed more by the, uh, by the plants that are sort of incorporating the, those areas. So the idea that a grass, a, a grass or a tree, you know, is putting out these exudates to select for the type of microorganisms that are, it's going to be most successful with, with trees selecting for a more fungal environment and the grasses or annual crops selecting for more bacterial environments rather than us controlling it. Um, and I, I guess on that note, you gave the example of applying this IMO solution that uh, essentially really hurt your macadamia nut trees. Um, and I'm wondering if it wasn't so much that uh, the soil was had a particular bacterial to fungal ratio, but maybe that the bacteria you applied uh, was more efficient at utilizing the nutrients in that soil for that period of time. And so the plant was actually nitrogen starved or uh, unable to access a lot of those, those soil nutrients because, or possibly that bacteria uh, had so much food source there that it actually created and generated, you know, an exothermic reaction through reproduction and heated the soils around the roots of the plants, which would stress it too. Um, I, I just, I wonder if there's other explanations for it beyond just a strict bacterial to fungal ratio. And I could be wrong. You know, I'm, I'm fully willing to admit that. Uh, these are just my initial thoughts regarding, you know, sort of that subject. I don't know what yeah. do you think about any of that. Yeah. And yeah, the, the, poten the potential for there to be other things um, specifically on those trees and them yellowing as a result of that. Um, totally. Is it possible that it was another thing? Um, yeah. I think, I think what we have is um, what we can observe. So like for that cropland or that grassland, I took microbial labs of the whole place um, before I started. And it was an extremely, you know, bacterially uh, grassland, uh, not suitable for grass production. Um, and then I um, took them after, and um, uh, the you know the amoeba increased, and you know all kinds of other, you know, um, cilia increased, and but. The, the one of the big changes was the balance of fungal to bacterial ratio. And so, yeah, you can, I mean, maybe there's an invisible reason in the interconnectivity of all of this that we don't yet know how to look at um, that could be the cause. But um, I think right now what I have to work with and the power of observation, I'm looking at that and saying, these plants don't like it when there's balanced soil fungally to bacterially. Um, and I think that's uh, probably pretty accurate. And uh, could there be a lot more to it? Totally. But um, I think where we're at in understanding that it's a pretty good um, uh, tool. Now, it might be that there, we're, we're looking at some, um, some disconnected cause or effect of something more complex that we don't yet understand. And that, that's possible. Um, but I think that um, it might be just reasonable to say, yeah, there's something to this fungal-to-bacteria ratio. Um, 
how forests grow and yeah yeah and this is tough for me because i totally agree with you on what you're saying i just i i cautious about drawing uh, a conclusion from a result without knowing what all the variables may be so when we like for just to use this example of this imo solution that you apply to the macadamia nut trees we don't know what it is about that application that caused the results that it did and and you think it's you know you, you believe it was because of the fungal to bacterial ratio and i'm just suggesting maybe it was from something else entirely having to do with that solution maybe it was too acidic or the ph was off or, or i have no idea i'm making stuff up at this point but the idea that we we observe something with nature and then have to be able to replicate it but also be able to draw the correct conclusions for what the mechanism of action is i think is really important and it may very well be like you said, this fungal to bacterial ratio, but it's just, it brings up a sort of a greater philosophical question for me when we evaluate all of these methodologies and all of these ideas around, around farming is all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if I can go and spray this fungally rich inoculum and kill fireweed while making grassland um, increase in fertility, well, then even if I don't understand exactly what's going on there. I've employed the principles of observation and science to uh, come to a conclusion that I can tend to the fungal life of grassland and kill a noxious weed while increasing production and thus increasing the dollars in the pocket for a farmer. And I might not need to understand a whole lot more um, for effective use of these principles. Sure, I mean, totally at the end of the day, it all comes down to plant growth and health and soil growth and health. And you're obviously a very successful farmer and have had great success with this. And and what you're doing, I think is amazing. And I love the fact you're working with the university to spread these ideas and get research done on these ideas. Like, I think that's just, that's just incredible. So please don't take any of my suggestions or comments as uh, in in any sort of negative way, because that Uh, really is not my intent. I just, I enjoy the discussion. And I like trying to figure out the yeah. how and why behind what you're seeing, you know, what we're observing, I think. And that's, that to me is a journey. It's not, it's not black and white and it's not anything that's good or bad. It's just, uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And I think it's something we want to keep striving toward. Uh, I am in no way offended. And, and I think it's uh, really important to have those conversations. I, I agree. And, and I think that um, what we're going to come to as we learn and and uh, kind of come to right thought or how things actually work, we're just going to keep partnering with how nature works. I think uh, whoever painted nature, the painter of it is uh, got a pretty good touch because the the deeper I dig into looking at it under a microscope and and understanding some of these interconnectivity things, um, the more I just go, wow, it's like a symphony. Like, like literally everybody is playing their, their tune and, and, and flawless, you know, kind of combination, even, even in, it, in, in degrees of chaos, you know, where there's like, there's decomposition and there's new growth and it's still like a symphony. It's, it's really fun. I, I really enjoy it. And I think, I think what you're saying is, is, um, is on where like, what, what is nature actually doing and how can we better partner with that? Yeah, well, I know I know you have to get going right now, so uh, we can sign off. But I just want to say thanks for your time today. And I know we didn't get we didn't totally talk about KNF maybe as much as I wanted to or or you wanted to. But uh, I'd love to follow up with you another time and just and, and just chat. And maybe I'll have another person on to talk KNF here in the near future. Cool, man. Well, thanks for having me. And yeah, super good to talk to you. That was Chris Trump, a Master Natural Farmer certified by Master Cho of Korea. You are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. Don't forget that there's more information and articles available on our website and blog at www.kisorganics.com, as well as links to the data and information we discussed in this episode on the podcast page. Thanks for listening.